Good morning. Welcome to this service of worship with the First Presbyterian Church of Highland, Indiana. Please know that you are welcome in the fullness of who you are, for who you are is beautifully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of our God who is love. This is the first Sunday of Christmas. That's right, we get to keep celebrating Christmas for several days more. After all, how could we not celebrate the good news of the Incarnation? I invite us to open the service of worship by breathing in the Holy Spirit. To begin the service of worship, we have the treat of the Nativity as told by the youth of our congregation. Please reflect, contemplate, and be inspired as you hear this story. When Elizabeth was six months pregnant, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a city in Galilee, to a virgin who was engaged to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David's house. The virgin's name was Mary. When the angel came to her, he said, Rejoice, favored one, the Lord is with you. She was confused by these winds and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. The angel said, Don't be afraid, Mary. God is honoring you. Look, you will conceive and give birth to a son, and you will name him Jesus. He will be great, and he will be called the Son of the Most High. So the Lord God will give him the throne of David, his father. He will rule over Jacob's house forever, and there will be no end to his kingdom. Then Mary said to the angel, How will this happen since I haven't been with a man? The angel replied, The Holy Spirit will come over you, and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. Therefore, the one who is to be born will be holy. He will be called God's son. Look over, look even in her old age. Your relative Elizabeth has conceived a son. This woman who was labeled unable to conceive is now six months pregnant. Nothing is impossible for God. Then Mary said, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be with me, just as you have said. Then the angel left her. This is how the birth of Jesus Christ took place. When Mary, his mother, was engaged to Joseph, before they were married, she became pregnant by the Holy Spirit. Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man. Because he didn't want to humiliate her, he decided to call off the engagement quietly. As he was thinking about this, an angel from the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Joseph, son of David, don't be afraid to take Mary as your wife, because the child she carries was conceived by the Holy Spirit. She will give birth to a son, and you will call him Jesus, because he will save his people from their sins. Now all of this took place so that what the Lord had spoken through the prophet would be fulfilled. Look, a virgin will become pregnant and give birth to a son, and they will call him Emmanuel. Emmanuel means God with us. When Joseph woke up, he did just as an angel from God command and took Mary as his wife. She gave back to a son. Joseph called him Jesus.
Christ's peace is with us always, no matter where we may be. And so, Christ's peace is with each and every one of us in this moment. Let us take it in. Let us really feel it. Please give somebody a call after the service to share Christ's peace. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And let us begin responsively the call to worship. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Break forth into joyous song and sing praises. Sing praises to the Lord with the lyre, with the lyre and the sound of the melody. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, let us make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the sea roar and all that fills it, the world and those who live in it. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, let us make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. Let the floods clap their hands. Let the hills sing together for joy at the presence of the Lord. For the Lord is coming to judge the earth. With trumpets and the sound of the horn, let us make a joyful noise before the King, the Lord. And now let us sing our opening hymn, Joy to the World. The author of Hebrews writes, The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. Together, let us confess to God with the assurance that the sun is interceding for us. God of grace and mercy, we confess that we often fail to embody the truth of the incarnation. When young women are pregnant outside of wedlock, we judge and condemn them. When tyrants declare the need for registries of vulnerable communities, we quietly accept it. When immigrants and refugees knock on our doors, we say that there is no room in the inn. 
We praise and glorify Jesus to this day, but we would not have welcomed him and his family as they were in reality. Forgive us for giving in to our worst impulses and resisting our better angels. In the name of Jesus, child of Mary, we pray. Amen. purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, where he intercedes for us even now. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and have life. Hallelujah. Thanks be to God. in the Trinity, being very and eternal God, of one substance, and equal with the Father, did, when the fullness of time was come, take upon him human nature, with all the essential properties and common infirmities thereof, yet without sin, being conceived by the power of the Holy Ghost in the womb of the Virgin Mary, of her substance so that two whole, perfect, and distinct natures, the Godhead and humanity, were inseparably joined together in one person, without conversion, composition, or confusion. Which person is very God and very human, yet one Christ, the only mediator between God and humanity? Will you join me please in the prayer for illumination? Guide us, O God, by your word and Holy Spirit, that in your light we may see light, in your truth find freedom, and in your will discover peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. Our Hebrew Bible lesson is taken from Isaiah chapter 52, verses 7 through 10. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy, for in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together in singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people, he has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see salvation of our God. Our epistle lesson is taken from Hebrews chapter 1, verses 1 through 12. Long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he also created the worlds. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being, and he sustains all things by his powerful word. When he had made purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become as much superior to angels as the name he has inherited is more excellent than theirs. For to which of the angels did God ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you? 
Or again, I will be his father, and he will be my son. And again, when he brings the firstborn into the world, he says, let all God's angels worship him. Of the angels, he says, he makes his angels winds and his servants flames of fire. But of the Son, he says, your throne, O God, is forever and ever, and the righteous scepter is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated wickedness. Therefore, God, your God, has anointed you with the oil of gladness beyond your companions. And in the beginning, Lord, you founded the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you will remain. They will all wear out like clothing. Like a cloak, you will roll them up, and like clothing, they will be changed. But you are the same, and your years will never end. Our Gospel lesson this morning is from the Gospel according to Luke, chapter 2, verses 8 to 20. In that region there were shepherds living in the fields, keeping watch over the flock by night. Then an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace among those whom he favors. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go now to Bethlehem and see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the child lying in the manger. When they saw this, they made known what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured all these words and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen as it had been told them. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Holy Spirit, you are welcome here, in our hearts and in our homes. Fill us with your wisdom as we listen for your word this Christmas tide day. Amen. Today's sermon is entitled, The Messengers. There are few things more unnerving for a mainline Protestant pastor raised and trained in the art of preaching from the carefully prepared manuscript than being asked to preach extemporaneously, on the spot, just as the Spirit leads. Extemporaneous preaching is certainly an integral part of many traditions but extemporaneous preaching was not part of my upbringing in any way, shape, or form. Of course, though, Holy Spirit moves as Holy Spirit moves. And so this mainline Protestant pastor with his dependence on manuscripts has found himself in several situations for which extemporaneous preaching was required. 
Those situations have tended to be when I do ministry in other countries, in contexts where messengers of the good news are frequently called upon to share the word at any given moment, especially if the messenger of the good news is clearly from a different context and thus might have something different to say. Thankfully, over the years, my comfort with preaching in the moment has grown just a teeny tiny bit, but still it has grown from absolute terror to just a little terror. I will never forget the very first time it was right around Christmas time in 2009 when I was doing my young adult volunteer year in the state of Kerala at the very southern tip of India. I had never been away from home for Christmas before. I was certainly surrounded by a loving community and adoptive family there, but it, of course, wasn't the same as being with my family family. It was really hot, and I was used to Christmas in winter. And I had been there for about four months, so my honeymoon period with the context and community was over. Needless to say, it was hard. I was going through it with a bit of a blue Christmas. Around that time, when I was feeling quite low, I was taken by my supervisor to an event at a Christian school several kilometers away from the community where I was living and working. I thought I was just going along for the ride as was often the case, to be introduced to some aspect of the context that I was not yet familiar with, or that my supervisor thought would be a good experience for me. I thought I was just going along for the ride. Famous last words right there. We pulled up to this school, which I was expecting to be a small school, and there were thousands of children seated outside waiting for our arrival. Thousands. And of course, word had gotten out that there was a site, Malayalam for white westerner in town who was there working with the church. And just like that, I went from ride-along companion to keynote preacher. As many of you know by now, I'm not very good at saying no to begin with, but I didn't even have the opportunity to do so this time. I got there, and I was whisked to the front to share the message in front of thousands. Did I mention that? Did I mention also that extemporaneous preaching was not part of my particular upbringing. And really, this was before a seminary, so this was before I had had any real training in preaching at all. Panicked, I looked up and saw that the name of the school was Good Shepherd School. In my memory box, there was a big mural on one of the walls of a shepherd holding a lamb. I can't promise that my memory is accurate if you happen to ever find yourself in the town of Kotayam and want to check the veracity, but if it wasn't on the wall, then it was projected in my mind by the Holy Spirit. And in that moment, Seeing the image of the Good Shepherd holding the lamb, my terror subsided a little bit, at least enough for the synapses in my brain to connect, and for thoughts to form, and for words to form, and for sentences to form that made sense. It was Christmas time, 
It was a school called the Good Shepherd. Aha! The shepherds in the field, being visited by the heavenly messengers, the angels of the Lord, and those all-important words, do not be afraid. For see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all people. Thinking of that scene in our scriptures, my remaining terror started to dissipate. Perhaps I was also receiving that message. Do not be afraid. So this messenger, who had been tasked unwittingly with sharing the good news, started giving a message about the shepherds, how they were the unlikeliest of people to receive a visit from the heavenly host in the eyes of the society, how they were probably young teenagers like David long before and like the students surrounding me at the school, and how they were, therefore, the best people possible to be the messengers of the good news of the arrival of the Messiah. The poor and marginalized would have trusted them because they were of them. The powerful who would have been threatened by a child with the claim of a king upon him would have simply dismissed them or ignored them completely, for surely shepherd children could not know what they were talking about. And, of course, they would not have thought anything was wrong or out of the ordinary with the Messiah entering the world in a stable after all, that was the shepherd's place. As my synapses connected and words formed, I realized that the good news I hoped to deliver was that the young and the poor and the marginalized, in short, the most of those students surrounding me, have the gifting and the power to change the world with the good news they have to share from their context. I honestly have no idea if that message successfully made its way through the layers of language and context and power and privilege that were folded up between us, but I do know for certain that since then, I have never stopped thinking about the young shepherd messengers in the field in our scriptures, or about the young messengers who were in attendance at the school that day. For thousands of years after the nativity of Jesus, it was still they who had the gifting and the power to bring good news to the world and change it forever. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Thus proclaims the prophet Isaiah about the messengers. For of course, at the time, the messengers would have been going everywhere on foot to spread the good news. In truth, those feet of theirs would have been calloused and gnarled and scarred, hardened and misshapen and wounded by the harsh landscape and the lack of supportive footwear. And yet, Isaiah says, how beautiful those feet are. Those feet are beautiful because of the sacred purpose that they serve. Those feet are beautiful because of the distances that they cover. 
Those feet are beautiful because of the people that they hold up and move around. Those feet are beautiful because of the message that those people had to deliver. When the angels of the Lord appeared in the field, these otherworldly beings with otherworldly voices and otherworldly movements, those feet did not run away with the terror felt by the shepherds. They stood firm so that the message could be relayed from the heavenly messengers to the earthly messengers. Do not be afraid, for see, I am bringing you good news of great joy for all the people. To you is born this day in the city of David a Savior who is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a child wrapped in bands of cloth and lying in a manger. Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth, peace among those whom he favors. Only then, after receiving the full message, did those feet run as the shepherds hastened to Bethlehem to see this thing that had taken place, which the Lord had made known to them. And then those feet roamed around the town and the countryside far and wide, as the shepherds proclaimed to all that had been told them about this child who lay away in a manger with no crib for a bed wrapped in swaddling clothes, born to a fierce, courageous teenager named Mary. And everyone who heard these shepherds proclaiming the good news listened and believed, because these messengers could be trusted. Because these messengers were shepherds, these messengers were of them. These messengers were raised by them. These messengers were entrusted with the care of their livestock, the only source of sustenance available to them. And so, because these very particular messengers with their very particular identities and their very particular experiences were trusted by all who heard them. And all who heard them were amazed. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, your God reigns. Listen, your sentinels lift up their voices. Together they sing for joy, for in plain sight they see the return of the Lord to Zion. Break forth together into singing, you ruins of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. The Lord has bared his holy arm before the eyes of all the nations, and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our God. Yes, indeed, how beautiful are the feet. Loved ones, all of this makes me think about the ways in which we ourselves are called to be messengers of the good news, announcers of peace, announcers of salvation. For we are indeed called to be so. After all, how could we not be amazed by the message that was proclaimed to the shepherds? How could we not be amazed by the message that was proclaimed by the shepherds? How could we not be amazed by the incarnation? How could we not be amazed by the promise of that incarnation? How could we not be amazed by a newborn baby being praised by angels and the whole host of heaven? 
How could we not be amazed by a mother who prophesied the turning of the world, the transformation of the world? By this child, this child who would lift up the poor and bring down the powerful, who would ensure that the hungry would go hungry no more. How could we not be amazed by it all? And if we are truly amazed, how could we not share the good news of all of that wonder, the good news of all of that love with great joy? Now, what does it mean? to be the messengers of wonder and love, messengers of the good news with joy today. Well, we heard about it all throughout Advent. It means to strive for justice for the poor and downtrodden. It means to speak truth to power. It means to share meals and tables with those who are hungry and those who are not welcomed and those who are not deemed worthy elsewhere. It means to comfort those who are hurting. It means to spend time with those who are ignored and lonely. It means to honor the children and the elderly. It means to treat everyone with dignity. It means to be courageous in the face of adversity. It means to speak up when the Holy Spirit moves us to do so, even when it feels terrifying to do so. It means to inspire and empower. It means to encounter with love, to speak with love, to act with love. And it means to do all of this with joy, drawing upon the deep well of salvation and transformation that fills our very being. And so it means living and breathing and being by following the example of that baby who would grow up to be our Lord. Yes, this is how we get those beautiful feet. Amen.
Let us pray. God of new life, we lift up our prayers today with hearts filled with joy at the birth of your Son, our Lord. We pray with the assurance of the promise of Christmas, the promise of the Incarnation, the promise of salvation in the flesh. And so, full of that promise, we pray for those most in need of your providence this day. We pray for those who have been sick, lonely, and isolated this year, especially during the holiday season. We pray also for those who have been providing care, providing comfort, and providing support. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who have been displaced from their homes due to violence, poverty, and natural disasters. We pray for those who are on journeys of migration across borders. We pray for those who are on journeys of migration from home to street. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are experiencing persistent unemployment and for those who are facing unemployment for the first time. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for those who are hungry in this country and across the world as poverty further entrenches and as famine sets in. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for the church, the body of your Son, Jesus Christ, including those beautiful feet, as we enter a new year of life together. We pray that we may continue to be created hopeful, and prophetic. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray for this congregation, for this community, for our families and our loved ones. O oh Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray in thanksgiving for the many ways that you make your presence incarnate in our lives. O oh Lord, in our gratitude, hear our prayer. Now, let us join our hearts and voices with the church in every time and place praying the prayer that our Lord Jesus taught us in whichever language is nearest and dearest to our hearts. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isaiah proclaims, How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of the messenger who announces peace, who brings good news, who announces salvation, who says to Zion, Your God reigns. Let us give our tithes and offerings so that we can continue to be those messengers. Please mail in your checks or use our online giving option. Now let us take a moment to reflect on stewardship as we hear the offertory.
join me in dedicating our gifts. O oh God, in the time of the Nativity, the angels and the shepherds proclaimed the good news of the birth of the Messiah, and all who heard it were amazed. We dedicate these gifts to you and to the mission of sharing your good news with the world. In the name of Jesus Christ, child of Mary, we pray, amen. And for our closing hymn, please join in the first Noel. Friends, as we stay in this day and continue to celebrate the joy of the Incarnation, I invite us all to consider what it means to be the messengers. For we have good news to share with this world that is in so much need of love. So let us share that message with joy. Let our feet be beautiful. We stay in the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the sweet fellowship of the Holy Spirit now and forevermore. Amen. <laughs>